The history of Tuesday is fuller than of any other day in Holy Week. First comes the walk of the Twelve Apostles and their Lord from Bethany at early morning. When they remarked how the fig tree had been cursed 24 hours before, stood blighted and blasted in the spot where yesterday morning it had looked so fair and flourishing. Repairing as usual to the temple, the Saviour is encountered by many enemies, who doubtless foresaw that his intention was, throughout this week, to present himself daily in the sanctuary of God. But he put them to silence with a question respecting the baptism of John, and then delivered the parables of the two sons and of the vineyard let out to husbandmen. In consequence of these discourses, the prophetic character of which they at once perceived, our Lord's enemies sought to lay hands on him, but were deterred through fear of the populace. Next, the parable of the king's son was added, after which the Pharisees and the Herodians proved him with a question respecting the payment of tribute. The Sadducees next assailed our Lord and were quickly confounded out of their own books, whereupon the scribes assailed our Saviour with an inquiry respecting the law. But after our Lord's reply, we hear that none durst ask him any more question. In turn, he also put one question, which the Pharisees were not able to answer, whereby he silenced them forever. This done, he denounced eight woes upon the Pharisees and Sadducees, ending with that passionate lament for Jerusalem. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and he looked up and saw the rich men casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. He rose and left the temple with his disciples, prophesying its destruction as he lingered for a moment on its threshold. Then, taking his seat on the Mount of Olives, the temple spread out before him and all the beautiful buildings of Jerusalem fill in view. In reply to the earnest questionings of Peter and James and John and Andrew, he spake of when these things should be and of what should be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world. In heaven the sun darkened and the moon forgetting to give her light and the stars falling like fruits from the tree on earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. Lastly, the coming of the Son of Man in glory and all his holy angels with him. The parables of the wise and foolish virgins and of the talents followed. And our Lord described how the just and the wicked shall be dealt with in the last day. After which, it being night, he went out and abode in the Mount of Olives. Now the one circumstance in all this wondrous and varied narrative to which we wish to call attention is that amid all these mighty discourses and amazing prophecies, amid all the weariness of his human body, and the, anxious, the anguish of his human soul, amid griefs unrevealed and bitterness of spirit unutterable, the Lord of heaven and earth was at leisure to sit down and watch the ways of one of the very humblest of his creatures. He saw also a certain poor widow. After his eight withering woes denounced upon the scribes and Pharisees, which must have goaded them to madness, 
for they were, they were at once the proudest and the most powerful of the people. After this, and just before he entered upon that far-sighted prophecy which glanced onward from the coming destruction of the city to the very end of the world, blending the near and the far future so wondrously, and showing that the blessed speaker's eye was filled with images of magnificence and grandeur unspeakable, the destinies of the whole human race and the consummation of all things. The moment is well worth observing, for it was the brief moment which separated the Saviour's discourse concerning the things of time and of eternity, the little halting place between his leave-taking of his enemies and his anticipation of the ruin which was to be wrought upon them, first by his avenging armies, next by his legion of angels. It was at that particular instant, we repeat, and therefore while his heart must have been occupied in the way we have been describing, that our Lord, sitting himself over against the treasury, that is the alms chests which were destined to receive the offerings of the people, looked up and beheld how they cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a poor woman, and as St. Luke remarks, he saw her. He saw before him the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem and the wreck of nature and the crash of worlds and the setting up of the great white throne and the gathering together of all the tribes of the earth. All this he saw, but he saw also a certain poor widow. And she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. He had the leisure, had the inclination, had the sovereign will to scrutinise the act and to weigh it in a heavenly balance and to pronounce upon it calmly and at length, as if life and death hung upon the issue. He called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all she had, even all her living. These gracious words on the lips of our Saviour awaken in us a deep sense of wonder and admiration. They remind us of all we have ever heard or read concerning the widow's might, but we cannot now afford space for any reflections on the transaction itself. No, we desire to fill our minds with the single thought of God's watchful and observing eye, which nothing is so little as to escape, nothing is so trifling as not to interest and engage. The psalmist has expressed this in a single verse of the 113th Psalm. Who is like unto the Lord our God, that hath his dwelling so high, and yet humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and earth? Strange as it may appear, we have great need to fill our minds with this thought, and to convince ourselves of its truth and constancy. It is hard to realise the notion of a providence which really takes note of the fall of a sparrow and numbers the very hairs of our head. We all profess to believe it, but it may well be suspected that there are few indeed who truly entertain the notion of such perfect knowledge, such watchful love as we are describing. It is not difficult to embrace the conviction that a mighty empire is the object of God's care, because to us a great empire seems a great thing. But that the fortune of the meanest person within that realm, in all its minutest details, should be equally the subject of his concern, this seems hardly credible. So again, we find no difficulty in believing that the more considerable events in our own lives are duly noted in the book of God's remembrance, 
because they are to us all in all. But the various petty chances which day by day befall us, the many minute acts which go to form a habit and which together make up a character, these, because they seem to ourselves so very petty, we are inclined to believe may be by God altogether unheeded. Thus we make ourselves the standard of all things, and even judge of God's eternal attributes by the measure of our own imperfections. Surely we shall do well at this time to try to banish from our minds so serious a mistake. Serious because this habit of regarding some things as little with God lies at the root of all sin, and occasions that practical infidelity of which men are guilty, as often as they speak as if they were overlooked by his providence. Uncared for and as it were forsaken by him, their trials unmeasured, their tears unnoted, their inward bitterness a secret to God as well as to man. Let it be ours to remember that we have to do with one who doth indeed measure the waters in the hollow of his hand, and meet out heaven with the span, and comprehend the dust of the earth in a measure, and weigh the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Yet, who feedeth his flock like a shepherd, and gathereth the lambs with his arms.